Hi, and welcome to the Fancy Comedy YouTube. Today, I'm joined by Santiago Giesler, an experienced science communicator, coach, and consultant with a PhD in molecular genetics from the Netherlands Cancer Institute, Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. Santiago helps science communicators enhance and propel their projects, communication skills, and careers. He also helps professionals outside science launch purposeful and self-realizing projects beyond nine to five. In parallel, he manages Ivory Embassy, a website and YouTube channel discussing interdisciplinary topics to promote healthy skepticism, scientific critical thinking, and honest dialogues. The platforms dissect science-related discussions on independent thinking, open communication, transparency, conflicts of interest, biases, fallacies, and scientific trust. Welcome, Santiago. It's great to have you on our YouTube. Maybe we should start with you were telling me before we were recording that you got stuck in Colombia during the pandemic and you and our first question that I have here is whether did you do pandemic psychom and if so what was your role so you have some stories to tell about pandemic psychom so what were you doing in the pandemic and how did that work out first of all it's great to be here I um during uh during the pandemic I was uh, living in Colombia the um, the idea was to uh, stay there for six months and work from there uh, as I had a remote work as a scientific writer for a Amsterdam based company. But during this time, I had a hobby going on, uh, which is the Ivory Embassy, uh, uh, my website, my pet project, um, where I which started um, with a purpose to to explain misconceptions in science to the general public such things like uh, cancer, the cancer cure, whether it's hidden or not, or correlation versus causation, all these type of small details that we as scientists, we, we get to familiar with, but maybe are not as explicit to the general public. So that was my, my project, uh, my side project, a hobby that I had while I was working for this Amsterdam company and my PhD, I was finishing my PhD. And um, and then we got all of a sudden about a week after the European restaurants and uh, and uh, um, shops started closing, we got the pandemic in Colombia, and uh, we got uh, we got into an excessive lockdown where we were only allowed to exit, go go out for one hour a day. So during this time, we were truly in a lockdown, except for this one hour a day where we could go out in the in the gassing sun and uh, and uh, run or or go shopping, basically to the supermarket to make the groceries. So this was my experience. And during this time, I also started writing a little bit about COVID-19 based on the little information that I would get. Uh, I would try to make things out of the, the research, try to explain the COVID research to, to my audience and uh, as, as well as, and as accurate as possible. So, uh, yeah, the, that, was, uh, that was basically uh, um, my experience. I, I got, uh, and during this time, we also got stuck in Colombia. So these uh, six months in Colombia became eight or nine months in the end where we were only waiting for for a flight to take us back to Europe uh, since all commercial flights were cancelled and they were not running anymore we had to be in contact with the French embassy Swedish embassy and uh, Dutch embassy to take us back to Europe and eventually we got we got into a flight uh, so that's that's basically the story of me uh, getting stuck in Colombia and during this time I was active both uh, both working for this uh, biophysics uh, biotech uh, company here in uh, Amsterdam and at the same time finishing my PhD and running Ivory Embassy, my, uh, my website. I heard a lot of stories of people getting stuck different places. Like, I feel like there were people on vacation that were just like stuck in their vacation destinations for a while. Because remember, they shut down all the traveling by air because they... I guess correctly predicted that that would create problems for the COVID. But so, what was it like living basically in in lockdown in Colombia? And what was your the scope of your science communication work there? Were you communicating to Colombians or to people outside of Colombia? 
Actually, we were quite lucky. We were living in Medellin. Uh, a couple of weeks before, we had been um, uh, on holidays in uh, a very exotic uh, island with basically limited electricity, limited resources overall, but very exotic, very beautiful. Uh, we had been there and after leaving there and during the lockdown, we got to hear that some people got um, stuck in this paradise island, which was seems like a dream, but at the same time with very limited uh, resources. So in a way we were lucky because we were back in Medellin, which is a, a rather big city with uh, a lot of different neighborhoods and uh, and incredibly uh, nice vegetation and, uh, and nature. So um, it was a bit frustrating since we could not uh, get out at all, but um, we made the best out of the situation, me and my partner, and we, we uh, tried to um, exercise as much as possible, both outside during the hour, uh, during the, the, the free hour, which was two to three o'clock, um, or we would uh, be doing exercises or different type of projects at home. And Ivory Embassy, my website, uh, became also a, some type of um, um, a ventilation system where, where I could uh, use that to to study and uh, the landscape, the information landscape, and and uh, inform not only Colombians but it's a it's an it's a blog in English, so so it's uh, it's directed towards mostly uh, uh, English speakers, uh, unless uh, you translate it. But uh, so so it's a very um, very broad audience. I have many many people from the U.S. But that kind of boosted a little bit my my uh, my um, my website for momentarily at least uh, because uh, people were genuinely interested. People wanted a lot of uh, wanted needed information about the the vaccines, about the uh, tests, about anything COVID related. People were hungry for information, and I think that attracted a lot of of, of people. I tried to digest a lot of. Uh, of this information. Uh, I think I, in the end, I wrote about four or five different uh, blog posts. But yeah, it was um, interesting times, interesting times. Different countries had different responses to the pandemic. And many countries, some countries such as China had like a very strict lockdown and no one could do anything. But then there's other countries like Australia at first didn't have that much COVID, so they didn't have to have a lot of restrictions. It sounds like you guys could only go outside for one hour a day. So I guess that was pretty strict for me in the pandemic. I also, I live in, a, in Oklahoma, which is a red state, and we had very, actually, we did not have very, la very strict COVID restrictions. We, um, masks were not required many people protested them so we actually had a really terrible time with covid and so i found that the only thing i could do that was safe relatively protected me from covid was to stay at my house and um try to do first of all try to figure out covid explain it to people and um try to do science communication so is that is that what you did kind of it's tough to say like we have to the, the post-mortem on like different countries covid response is kind of difficult because it depends on their different governments and also whether they're what their public health people said but did you struggle with um work-life balance while you were doing this or did you find that you were not able to you just worked all the time i didn't feel the that the the work-life balance was skewed during this time. I felt like I was kept busy, and of course, the the restrictions uh, we had affected our moods as well, since we were indoors, not meeting too many people, not in contact with too many people either. So that, of course, aff affected our our stress levels and uh, and um, and uh, yeah, mood in general. But it's. Uh, it was a giant experiment. I think it's. it was also a global experiment. Like you said, not every country dealt with it similarly uh, because we basically didn't know. Um, I'm from, uh, I'm born and raised in Sweden. Sweden had one of the most loose um, uh, 
uh, rules in uh, in uh, Europe where people were still going out uh, to restaurants, uh, masks were no, not mandatory. Colombia was the complete opposite, uh, complete lockdowns. Uh, we could go to the groceries based on on uh, on days based on our uh, on certain days based on our number, our, our ID number or passport number. So the last the last uh, number of that passport of our passport number would di dictate whether you could go to the, the groceries that day or not. So it was uh, a, a very very um, uh, special situation in uh, in many regards, and I think that in the end we could see that uh, that while while the numbers were high in some places at at one moment they could easily go down at the same time uh, later on where other countries would would uh, would see much more much higher numbers in in uh, infections uh, but uh, at that moment we just trusted the the um, also in colombia it, it was no no other choice than to to stay inside you could, we would get uh, quite high fines to to go out or or not using the masks so there was no question about it it was just do do as they say or the police will get you <laughs> it sounds like they did a very good job of they enforced it very stringently because here in the u.s you could go outside without a mask i mean you might get kicked out of somewhere but you wouldn't get fined by the police like that would be intense because I, I think the police actually decided they wouldn't find people and uh here in the u.s our, our law enforcement was not too crazy about i don't think they were that crazy about mask mandates and everything because they for whatever reason so and here in Oklahoma we didn't have anything like that so it's hard now because I, I don't think about COVID as much anymore and I have to work to like reflect on it and think about what I actually did so I can you know move forward because it was a very difficult four years for everyone but so um, what was the highlight of your work doing science communication basically trapped in very scenic in very scenic Medellin, Colombia. And what was the highlight and what was the low light? The highlight was definitely the fact that I, I could um, I, I could expand on new new information, news that uh, had never been seen before and kind of analyze this. Also, I got a uh, much, uh, I, I expanded my, um, the engagement in uh, on on my website and uh, and that was nice to get uh, some type of conversation with our my readers and uh, people requesting uh, a lot of um, uh, types of articles that was a nice uh, development also my 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 approach towards uh, ivory embassy changed slightly i started becoming more interested in the philosophy of science and and questions like for example um, values and empirical knowledge and uh, balancing these um, uh, more philosophical but that are scientifically related for example whether or not we should trust the science uh, when it comes to vaccines or 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 if it if it even is a scientific uh, uh, qu question or if it's policy making and democratic uh, so this type of this type of decision making and policy making are is uh, very interesting and uh, and there is a balance between them so that's the the fun thing i i developed the ivory embassy to something a little bit more philosophical psychology uh, psych more mixing philosophy psychology and communication now the low lights was that uh, of course that i was i was busy with a lot of uh, things at the same time and uh, uh, combined with the fact that the moods and uh, stress might have uh, been a little bit altered not too excessively but uh, but still uh, some some effect to some extent um i was a bit in a stressful uh, stressed situation where i where i had to deal with um, you know a lot of work uh, the workload uh, uh, might have increased a bit and also finishing my phd there was a there was a, just something that coincidentally happened at the same time um, that I had to finish it and the stress with the PI and the professor and uh, and all, all these kind of things uh, happened at the same time. So that was a bit stressful and it uh, affected me uh, quite a lot uh, eventually to to process. Uh, I had to process this uh, whole situation eventually. But uh, but luckily 
I succeeded with the, and uh, got over all these uh, obstacles and um, and uh, things cleared up. And uh, now now I'm uh, I'm I'm kind of um, I'm kind of in the middle of of develop further developing my my scientific uh, or, or science communication projects, uh, trying to help the scientific community and the general public as much as possible to interconnect. And one thing that I learned um, uh, during the COVID is um, is kind of to find your place and uh, find your niche and uh, try to learn as much as possible because specifically, especially with the COVID uh, uh, related questions, these these were very delicate and uh, just minor errors could also affect the public opinion quite uh, quite excessively and uh, and there is a there is a, an importance in being a bit more accurate and uh, and uh, you know tactful when you when you com communicate about this uh, type of topic, especially when they get politicized as uh, as we've seen. The politicization of science became a huge problem here in Oklahoma, um, and also in other places because it kind of went both ways. Here in Oklahoma and in in the U.S., we were so divided. Some states they had like California or Ohio had very strict mask mandates and some vaccine requirements. Other states like Oklahoma, we didn't, we banned vaccine mandates and mask mandates because it came down to what the voters want, what the people wanted. And so they threatened to kick their elected officials out of office if they forced them to get these tech, these things. And some of it I think is like a fear of the unknown, but I think another part of it is people don't like stuff forced on them. And here in America, in the US, Americans value their personal freedom. I learned from just living in the U.S. during this time that people, they, they, this science communication can help to some extent. I think that there are questions that were, that went unanswered that could have helped people, but I don't think people would believe the answers or they even wanted the answers because they had their own views. And I'm not sure what we, what could have been done differently. And I think that maybe if there was another pandemic, I don't know what you think about this, but like, what was the level of vaccine hesitancy or, I mean, in Colombia, I don't even know what they had with respect to vaccines. I don't know much about their government, but I imagine that they, they did have very, paid a lot of attention to COVID because they had these very strict lockdowns and you would get fined if you didn't um, comply with them. But um, what were the people of Colombia? Like, were they, where you were staying? Did they have a desire to, you know, curb the spread, as we said here in the U.S., to like wear masks and stuff? Or were they kind of just doing it all begrudgingly? Were there protests? We saw both. Um, I left before the vaccine started uh, rolling out. But uh, um, um, the thing is that we had to follow the, 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 the law, basically, and stay inside. And it was so weird to to go out on the streets in in medellin that usually are completely packed with people and traffic and noise all over and all of a sudden i found myself walking alone on the street on the way to the groceries and it felt like this scene in um, you know the joker the movie the joker where he is uh, standing on a on uh, on the steps and uh, basically uh, dancing and doing exaggerated movements, you felt a little bit like that. You had the whole street for yourself and uh, and no cars. Um, and during this time, the the infection rates in uh, Medellin and Colombia they were extremely low. There was no barely any any cases. Basically, I think they handled it pretty well under those circumstances. I'm not saying that this is morally or ethically justifiable, but uh, at the moment it's uh, it's at least uh, it worked. As soon as I left Medellin and Colombia, we got to know from our friends in Colombia that we had uh, gotten to know there um, that uh, they opened up the shops one day and reduced the kind of gave reduced price based on on the VAT, the, the, the reduced VAT, so the tax, and uh, which led to a massive storming of, of the of the shopping malls and shops in general. And uh, and from there on, 
the cases in Colombia started just increasing day by day by day by day and there was basically no stopping it and and the last numbers that i saw from colombia were were quite quite similar to to the ones we saw here in europe maybe um i don't know in the us but at least it was similar to the to the the cases here in europe so they they could not escape it uh, eventually even though they had this uh, strict re uh, restrictions i think it's uh, also important to see that um, there has been a lot of, uh, we talked briefly about the politicization of, of, uh, of COVID and mandates, masks and uh, vaccine mandates and school, school closings and things like that. Um, this is something that's interesting me a lot and uh, something that I'm, I'm digging into. I'm writing about it. I have uh, a couple of, of uh, blog posts now about um, the, um, the distinction between value judgments and empirical judgments and how uh, certain questions should involve the decision of policymakers or, or the population of a certain society. Uh, while other questions, maybe we should let the experts, uh, we should trust their opinions. Uh, and that we can categorize into value judgments and empirical judgments where the value judgments are questions like, for example, as we mentioned now, uh, should we mandate uh, masks or vaccines? While this seem, may, might feel morally and ethically right and maybe superior, there might be a lot of, uh, there might be people um, on, uh, on the, uh, that are opposing that, that feel that maybe this free form of expression or liberties or social liberties are much more valuable than a uh, uh, COVID, uh, um, COVID free or COVID reduced society. These are complicated questions, but at least being aware of them can help us navigate uh, the, the, the debates and discussions uh, uh, in this very complex, uh, within these very complex questions. So it's something that I'm, I'm extremely interested in and trying, and I'm trying to clarify to my audience and, uh, and, and uh, every, anyone that is willing to read about it, having an open discussions where, where, where I, where we discuss the, the, the different aspects of, of decision making and, uh, and, uh, in a, yeah, in an attempt to get, the, get to get uh, to reduce the stigmatization of people that might might oppose uh, mandated vaccines or 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 masks, for example, and this is nothing new. I I I think this has been a debate for a long time uh, whether we should mandate vaccines, for example, against uh, the um, uh, the MMR vaccines or or other types of vaccines. Uh, this is there are both pro and cons uh with uh, with the arguments and uh and i think it's something that requires also some type of engagement not only by experts but also from 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 the general public to to be engaged to to be aware of what's what we know and what we don't know and the different values that we have in our society one thing that we didn't realize would be a challenge in the pandemic was these value judgments for, I, I guess what you're saying, like valuing like personal autonomy and personal liberties in the case of many Oklahomans, actually many people are now vaccinated or they have natural immunity. I saw on CNN that 99% of Americans either have, vaccin have been vaccinated or have natural immunity, but just v bridging, figuring out what part of the vaccines. So if we have to have, if vaccines are proven to reduce, you know, if we want to use vaccines, how can we get people to start thinking about vaccines in a way that is, can we get people to start thinking about vaccines in a way that doesn't just shake them to their core and just make them think like, oh no, I'm definitely not going to get this because it just goes against everything as who, of who I am. Why would I put this in my body? And I think that's what we saw like a lot. We see a lot of that. And I think, and I don't know, here in the US, we have Pfizer commercials, like every five seconds, there's a very famous football player for Kansas City. His name is Travis Kelsey, and he's also Taylor Swift's boyfriend right now. And he's on Pfizer, but they show him, he has his little, he got his like double vaccines. He shows his arm, he's like, like this. And so I get, and um, I don't know to what extent does 
running ads like that kind of get rid of this idea and like normalize the idea of vaccines because they're here in the U.S., we also, in Florida, there's currently a measles outbreak. And I don't know how they got measles because when I was a kid, I got vaccinated for measles when I, it just as part of my regular medical care. But I, I don't know, like, what it's going to take to combat these public health challenges. Because if it's not with vaccines, it will have to be with some other kind of thing. Or do people really, their, their personal decision is they'd rather get, risk getting measles, which can be very can be very dangerous rather than just getting a vaccine that may have short-term side effects and to scientists it's an it's it, the value judgment's different because scientists understand the science like i can explain how the vaccine works and i have no problem answering questions about it and but many people they do not have that information or maybe their value system is different i don't know i haven't done a deep dive into the philosophy of it's a touchy subject because I feel like just by talking about vaccines, it invites people that are that don't like vaccines. I, it's kind of scary to talk about them. So I feel like there's definitely like a very significant misinformation piece beyond the just the people don't want to get vaccines. If you don't want to get vaccines, basically, you don't have to get vaccines. You just have to. It's like a cost benefit analysis. And for some people, they rather have the the risks and not get the vaccine, but other people, they'd rather get the benefits and get the risks of the vaccine, which I'm, by now, people keep saying like the vaccine's risks are very low, but the risk of getting these diseases is actually much higher. But it's amazing to the extent that different people in society weight these differently. It's, it's mind boggling, especially, I don't know if you feel this way. As a science communicator, I feel that Sometimes every day in the pandemic, I was like, wow, people really don't care about science or they don't. Um, like, I spent well, my whole career so far talking about science every day. And here are people just completely discounting this. And many of them were on their deathbeds, like being like, oh, I wish I would have gotten the COVID vaccine. Or I saw a lot of people, they were people tricked the, the people told them don't get the vaccine it's got like x y and z things that are bad for you and then they were dying and the news interviewed them and they said oh i'm so sorry i i didn't get the vaccine because of misinformation and distrust of vaccines and um what what do you think the role of science is going forward in that based on your studies of this or what has ivory embassy done or you, so you promote healthy skepticism. So like, what's, that's good to know because I think skepticism is a huge part of like being a scientist and analyzing stuff. So what is, what do you have to say about this? There's a lot we can say about this. Um, one thing that I want, just want to touch upon is uh, during, uh, when I came back to Amsterdam, I, I left my, um, my work at the, this biotech company and started working for the European Medicines Agency, which is roughly speaking and very simplistically said a little bit like the US FDA. Um, so um, while the European Medicines Agency don't uh, doesn't authorize medicines, they recommend uh, medicines and, and, and vaccines. They can uh, at a at a European level. I was I worked there as a medical writer, which is basically a science communicator, and uh, answering a lot of uh, queries from the public. And we could definitely see the confusion there. There is a ex there was an extreme mix between a lot of belief systems, misconceptions about uh, vaccines, but then also a lot of um, a lot touched upon upon the upon questions that didn't have so much to do with science but mu much more about you know this type of things like uh, the right to travel the right to go to school or or you know um uh, vaccine mandates masks and things like that things that we in the end could not answer but you could we could at least observe all these misconceptions and doubts that people had so that's why it, with that, I just want to say that it's an extremely complicated uh, situation and ideas and arguments become mixed between value judgments and like we touched upon before, uh, value judgments and, and empirical knowledge that we have. And uh, like I said, 
this is something that I've, I'm, I'm extremely interested in. And from what I can see, the trust in science remains pretty consistent and pretty high. Uh, even in the US, people still trust scientists. Now we have a, a, a lot of different issues. And from what I can see, the US might have issues as well when it comes to healthcare, um, the, 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 the access to healthcare or um, the, the role of the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, you mentioned how, how you could see Pfizer making this type of advertising on TV. We don't see that in Europe. And uh, this type of um, this type of uh, scenes might might also give. Uh, we we are naturally skeptical against people that are trying to sell us things openly, and and it might create a, a distrust in not so much the scientists that are trying to figure out how diseases uh, um, happen or 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 trying to develop uh, uh, biotechnical uh, tools but more about people that try to benefit from this, uh, from, uh, from uh, drugs or health or education for that matter. And, um, and people are skeptical in general, and uh, we should be. Uh, there is a lot of conflicts of interests, a lot of biases, a lot of hidden agendas as well. Uh, within the discussion and we need to and that's why I, I, I like to emphasize the the need for people to engage and and really try to understand th the parts of the discourse where we can we can uh, make a difference and that we and and separate that from the scientific discourse so the scientific consensus the scientific consensus is pretty solid it's I'm not saying it's 100% true, but at least it's solid. We have uh, a, a community of scientists that have been researching this and reviewing it and questioning uh, details after details after details. But then we have the other parts that are not about the scientific consensus and where sometimes we as scientists, we can get the feeling that we have uh, a continued authority beyond the realm of, uh, of empirical knowledge. That now, because we know that vaccines might save lives, then my idea that we should do make vaccines mandatory should be also um, an author uh, or authoritative uh, idea, and this is where where it becomes a bit of a a little bit blurry. Where does the where does my my um, authority as a um, as a scientist begin and where does it end beyond our our scientific knowledge we may have ideas we're going to have ideas and opinions about it but as as long as it, they are not neutral scientific empirical knowledge our authority ends where where the empirical knowledge ends where like how do you make someone feel at ease about the risks of vaccines and do yeah. so in a way that you're not overstating the benefits and you're not understating the risks because that's very important in human subjects research as i've learned and um i think that is really like a very hard challenge but it's a communications challenge because the information is there the people there it can help people like if vaccines can help people but we can't communicate how vaccines can help people and we can't actually convince people to get vaccines how useful is it to have vaccines anyway? Like it's, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a, um, one of those things that the pandemic revealed these vaccine hesitancy and people not getting vaccines. There's pockets in the US where they just don't get their childhood vaccines. And for the most part, because of the way herd immunity works, it's, it's fine. It, no, cause it's the public health challenges of, I mean, like, and the other thing is, there's a very small group of people that have these, not very small, but like relatively, when you think about it here in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, 50% of people got vaccinated and we're, we're a Republican state. So um, it's not that we think that vaccines are evil and they're, I mean, that's part of it. There's many different narratives that I could go on and on about, but the thing is just getting people to understand the science of vaccines, like, and how much do people believe that when we explain the science of vaccines to them, 
we're doing that to help them not to like benefit big pharma or to push our views on them or something. And I think that's a huge challenge. And if we want to, and I, I don't know, I hope we don't have any pandemic issues like this again, because the the divides, the divides that were already created in society here in the US, cultural divides of which vaccines just became another part. And then our senators, the GOP judiciary Republicans tweeted one day, they tweeted, if vaccines work, why don't they work? And so now I, I think there's this whole thing about like hesitancy mixed with politicization of vaccines and um, people's medical decisions are up to them. I'm not saying, I don't think anyone should get medical treatments they don't believe in, but I, but there's definitely been a few times where like, I didn't want to get a medical treatment and my, and I talked to my friends and family and they were like, well, this is actually really great. Like, it's really convenient. Like your health benefits will be such and such. And I think that we didn't really have that on any large scale. I don't know what we're missing. Mm -hmm. We have to do a postmortem. That's a terrible metaphor, but I was telling, mm -hmm. there was a guy I interviewed on here that, that did Ebola communications in 2014. And he had to explain the science of Ebola to Africans. And I was telling him about the postmortem. And um, amazingly here in the US, he said that Americans didn't understand how Ebola works. And they thought that if you flew over a nation and you had Ebola, then you would you would get Ebola, which that's not how Ebola works at all. It's, um, mm. it's got, you get it through close contact. So I, maybe it's a cultural thing. I don't know, like, have you spent time in the US? Like, do you know anything about our struggles? We have a huge struggle with this, right? We've had it for several years and I, I don't know if it's gotten better. Here in Europe, we have, um... We follow the U.S. very closely. Um, we have a, a lot of our TV shows and uh, and um, a lot of what we read on the newspaper is uh, very um, very focused on the U.S. as well. So uh, usually we are aware of what's going on there, and um, from one what I can see, it is a very politicized uh, um, problem. Or, or a very politicized question, the the whole pandemic uh, related the COVID, uh, the COVID question. I can see that um, when people talk about it, they prefer to talk about it as uh, in in association many times uh, to Democrats versus Republicans or uh, these political views versus these political views. And that is something that exists here in Europe as well, but it's not as delineated. So it's not as political, uh, of a, as, as much as of a political question. I'm not saying this is, this is uh, because we're better here. It's just the, a difference in, in the political system and the culture of, uh, between uh, Europe and, and, and the US. I think that you bring up uh, very valid points that, um, that is also the role of uh, of the science communication to uh, to um, kind of um, highlight this type of not only the good th sides with, for example, vaccines, uh, but also highlight the um, where where we're going wrong, where we can improve. We need to we need to show an increased transparency to the general public and to other scientists and start daring to to have discussions like the discussions that we have when, once we're inside the academic walls where we have journal clubs or um, research clubs where we kind of question each other's um, evidence or, or results and, uh, and arguments. And this is, a, this is something that I see that specifically outside of academia, we, we, we have a tendency in general as, as humans to, to choose a camp that we want to, that we associate mostly with. This this type of of, uh, of tribalistic uh, thinking kind of confounds the 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 actual the the the, the, the actual arguments of of, uh, of of this type of difficult situations like the COVID nineteen pan pandemic. So yes, we need to. I think it's uh, important for us as uh, science communicators to be able to honestly uh, discuss the. Um, the, the, for example, the, the COVID virus, uh, the origins, the, the vaccines from an honest point of view. And as 
apolitical as possible, at least the scientific uh, uh, evidence, and as neutral and objectively as possible. And we need to be able to have differences and without mockery because because that's something that i also see from from the different camps that form that we we start mocking each other especially i know that we both are sometimes at least me i engage in twitter or I, I i read my twitter uh threads and what i don't like about twitter is that it can very quickly become a you very quickly see discussions that are that are based on on mocking or stigmatizing other people because they believe or they ask the wrong questions and and i've seen that both with non experts and with scientists or experts that who receive questions and immediately discard these questions like stupidity and this is this is not how science communication should work we should we because we are still part of the society we're not above anything so we need to be able to reflect on the both the good sides and the and the bad sides of of uh, this type of scientific questions honest and transparent uh, dialogues between scientists and between scientists and general public can help us also understand the difficulties uh, of of scenarios like like the COVID-19 pandemic. I always liken political communication and science communication together. If you want to know what people are thinking, what are their attitudes and beliefs, ask them what are like if we had if we thought of vaccine hesitancy as like a making that like putting vaccines in the public sphere, like we have to go up to everyone, ask them, hey, what's your opinion on vaccines? And then they would tell us their opinion on vaccines. And then based on their questions, we could develop a narrative about that. But I think that there was no mm. mechanism, at least in the US to do that. It sounds like at the EMA, they were able to field some questions. It's a little bit late for this pandemic, but maybe in the next pandemic, we'll have different challenges. So hopefully we can have a few years mm. between now and our next pandemic so that I can take a break from from thinking about these things because it really makes your head spin Hopefully. when you think about the science and then what people think about the science and trying to figure out a way to make the people's to, to just be part of that conversation because it's it, it's just it's um it's definitely very challenging but definitely very important to to think about those things so before we conclude tell us a bit about ivory embassy what do you do what can We'll put all the links in the description box so people can come visit your ivory embassy and learn more there but tell us a bit about that and what anything cool that's happening ivory embassy is my little pet project that i've created together with um, a colleague when i was uh, um, doing my phd here at the netherland cancer institute um, we started it together with another phd student to um, to answer questions of from the general public or or doubts or miscon uh, misconceptions or beliefs that uh, that uh, don't really correlate with with the reality so we we, we try to to explain a, a basic scientific concept to the general public with time it has developed it has become more uh, a tool it it was always a, meant to be a tool where we don't give you the answers immediately we can give our opinions but in the end we we want to push people to make their own uh take their own conclusions and and uh, and form their own opinions based on 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 research but with uh, time it has developed it has uh, now become a platform where i discuss topics related with science philosophy psychology and communication within that also journalism and um and especially with a spe specific interest in an attempt to increase transparency in science um increase the open and honest dialogues within the scientific community and between the scientific community and uh, the general public hence the name ivory embassy basically acting as a t an embassy between the ivory tower and the general public and um, and as well to reduce um, biases fallacies and conflicts of interest and and uh, corruption within our um, with, within these entities in uh, within science so trying to 
create an open dialogue with uh, between people, treating issues like a r- journal club where we can critique other people's um, results or ideas without the fear of of uh, be- um, b- without the fear of being mocked or stigmatized because of it. Uh, so the the whole idea is that we we don't need to always agree with each other, but at least we can learn from each other. And and this is something that I I would like to. This is a type of mindset or mentality that I think is, exists in science, or or is very prominent in in the scientific community, which I want also to be prominent outside of the academic world uh, walls of science. So I aim it to. Uh, science communicators and scientists, but it's also made for whoever is interested in in uh, these type of topics. And now recently, I started this uh, YouTube channel uh, with my first and last name, so Santiago Gisler. And the idea is the same. I'm uh, I had never started. I have not never had a YouTube channel before, so I had to learn from scratch all the editing and uh, and filming. Just speaking in front of a a black rectangle was a bit odd at first, but uh, and it's still odd. But it's becoming more and more natural. But the idea is to kind of uh, f- uh, formulate this type of thoughts to whoever is interested in in not only learn but not only crit- critique of of uh, research or 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 of our scientific landscape, but also uh, you know learning about becoming a better independent creative thinker. Uh, critical thinking, communication, how to improve this, and how ca- how we can engage with each other, for for the better of of individual intellectually and also for the for uh, our society and communities. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today, Santiago. Thanks a lot.